dear uh, teacher and dear beloved community, uh, by a show of hands, how many of us slept well last night? Thank you. I celebrate that. That's uh, wonderful news. And how many of us had a little bit more challenge sleeping last night? And some people put your hands up all the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's like that in terms of the Dharma. It's both this and it's both that. As we were sitting in this hall, um, I was so impressed with the energy of the Sangha. We were sitting quietly, uh, we were following our breathing. And I was reflecting on the fact that um, the Dharma is not contained in talks, even this one. Uh, the Dharma, if we think it's contained in talks, or teachings, or books, or retreats, or CDs, we're caught in science. We've turned the, the Dharma from its original intention into a thing, into a set of techniques. And this is not the Buddha's teaching. The Dharma is not a thing. The Dharma is our way of encountering every moment. The Dharma is our way of moving through the world, of being present with our breathing, present with our steps, fully there in each moment. So the real Dharma talk was just a few minutes ago. We were all sitting in silence. In fact, I was quite impressed because I could hear somebody near me writing notes. <laughs> I thought, this is great, we'll sit here for another 45 minutes. The <laughs> Dharma is our way of showing up and showing up for what is in our life. And so the Dharma that is the living Dharma of our own life it might be slightly different from the Dharma of what's showing up in another person's life. Our teacher, Tay, gave us um, stickers many years ago um, when I was a young novice to put in our shoes. And also he gave us a little card about the size of a business card, which was kind of uh, uh, ironic since um, Tay always talked about business less Ness. Be businessless. But anyway, he gave us a business card and stickers, and on that card and stickers were written 100%. 100%. And he shared with us that this is the kind of spirit we bring to each moment. And I was thinking about this because the title of this retreat is Togetherness, and we think about togetherness is coming together as a community and this is one aspect for sure but another aspect is being fully there unified body speech and mind whatever we're doing 100 percent i sit here 100 percent i drink my tea 100 percent i take each step 100 percent I talk with my friends, I'm present with my friends, 100%. I'm not divided anymore. In this way, if we're able to practice this during these next few days, these next few days can be some of the most transformative days of our life. Otherwise, it can be nothing special at all. Sometimes people come to a Plum Village retreat and they say, you really don't do anything special at all, don't do anything much during the retreats. You don't have a whole lot of formal practice and so on. And this is quite actually quite intentional. It's quite easy to sit there for three, four, five, eight hours a day. It's much more challenging and much more subtle to bring that quality of open-hearted attention that we call mindfulness to our step, to our breath, to the absolutely ordinary moments of our life, the moments that we think we need to get done 
so we can get to the real practice. You know what? The real practice is the moments in between. The moments when we feel bored. The moments when we're looking for something to do. This is where real insight can arise. When we touch those moments, there's a poem of Basho that I share often with friends, and it seems quite present for me today. Uh, we came down from the Blue Mountains where spring has come, and we're coming down here a little bit further south, where spring is just beginning. The leaves are just budding. Those of us from Brisbane have come from the middle of summer, basically. <laughs> down to winter, we, we feel how it is for you. Sending you love and kindness. <laughs> um, and the spring is just budding. There's a poem by Basho. It's a short uh, uh, four-line poem. Sitting quietly, doing nothing. Spring comes and the grass grows by itself. Sitting quietly, doing nothing. Often we approach our practice or our cultivation of mindfulness of certain qualities, whatever we're looking for, as this form of effort. I have to strive. I have to do this, and then I'll accomplish that. Doing nothing. So during these next few days, what I really want to invite everyone to do is to do nothing. It doesn't mean don't show up to the schedule, <laughs> things like that. But rather, as we're, um, as we're going through our day, we're letting it be a delight. We're simply showing up for what's there without um, trying to manufacture an experience. But just being there, spring comes and the grass grows by itself. So the first thing I want to invite everyone to do is what I've shared already, and that is to give yourself the gift of the 100%. And notice those moments when we're divided during these next few days. Our body is in one place, our mind is in another. And come back together. A person in Buddhism is not called a noble person or a noble practitioner because of their birth or their gender or anything else. But a person is called noble when their body, their speech and their mind are together in one place. So this is the first invitation. And the second invitation I'd like to invite everyone to enjoy practicing these next few days is to look at our how much effort we put in and allow things to be effortless. We sit in such a way, we walk in such a way, we um, share together in such a way that it is a delight. As practitioners, we've done very well, and many of us are long-term practitioners, we've done very well to cultivate one of the bodies of awakening, which is called the Dharma body. We've done very well. But uh, one of the other bodies of awakening that I think could use a little bit more cultivation is the enjoyment body. We forget that that's uh, also uh, a body of awakening. The Dharma body, the retribution body, which is our physical body, is also a body of awakening. And our physical environment is also a body of awakening. But we forget, and we don't um, cultivate the, the bliss body. It's actually the, the literal translation, the bliss body or the enjoyment body. And in the Pali text, the original uh, uh, sutra text, um, this energy of delight um, is, uh, we're invited as practitioners to cultivate it in such a way or our experience of this sense of delight in whatever we're doing is meant to saturate our being just like uh, the water would saturate a ball of clay. Pick up some clay and soak it in water. The water will saturate that. In. So as practitioners, this is one of the characteristics 
of a quote unquote, I don't want to evaluate, but a quote unquote successful practice. That we walk in such a way, eat in such a way, breathe in such a way, that that sense of joy, that sense of delight, of bliss is present. And then you don't need anybody to tell you that you're a good practitioner. You don't need anybody to give you a certificate because you yourself know, you yourself experience that. We often approach our meditation practice as a cultivation of something. Many of us came to practice because we were or we are looking for something. And that's wonderful. It's kind of a skillful means. It's kind of like um, those sales that they have, like in fast food restaurants to get you through the door. Get this, you know, you'll get this as a special gift as you come through the door. The Lotus Sutra, the Buddha um, shared uh, the story of um, an elder whose uh, house is burning down and the children are playing with toys and uh, they don't want to go out of the house, they don't see the danger at all. So the, the Buddha says, I've got special uh, toys for you outside, I've got this, I've got that, come and get those toys. And the children got so excited uh, that they run out of the house and they, they saw that in fact the, the father didn't have those toys, he had something much better for them something that they never expected. But the toys were a way to get them through the door. So we approach our practice in the beginning because we think we need to cultivate something that we don't have already. I become a practitioner because I want peace, I want happiness, I want liberation, I want enlightenment. So it gets us through the door. And if that's where it ends, that's already something we should celebrate. That's wonderful. It's a great thing. But then, if we're really lucky, we discover that, in fact, our practice is not about getting something that we don't have already. It's about discovering that that which we're looking for has already been there, has always been there. And rather, we're just recognizing and bringing forth our essential nature. I shared with the Sangha not so long ago that as I was looking deeply into the, um, the phrase in praise of the Dharma, that the Dharma is immediately useful and effective, I began to realize that uh, walking meditation, walking mindfully, taking a step with 100% of our being, sitting in meditation, eating mindfully. It's two things at once. It's a cultivation, in a way, but it's also the very fruit of the practice. We sit mindfully in order to sit mindfully. The fact that we can sit there, enjoy our breathing, that's already the fruit. That's what you're looking for, right there. Tasting the food fully, being present for our feelings, being present with another person. That's a practice and a fruit at the same time. Why do we think we need to practice to obtain something later? From my heart, my request is during these next few days, if not for the rest of our practice life, touch it right here and right now. If you're looking for liberation, eat in such a way that you are liberated with every step, with every mouthful. Walk in such a way that you, every step is liberation, not a step towards liberation, but a step of liberation, a step of loving kindness. Practice is both a cultivation and a fruit at the same time. If the Dharma is outside of space, outside of time, why do we think we need to practice for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, a thousand lifetimes to obtain something in the future? It's right here and right now and we just don't see it. In the Tintai philosophy, 
which was developed by Master Ji Yi in China in the year 600. Uh, he shares something that I find interesting. I might be the only one, it's certainly possible, but I find it very interesting and very helpful. He said that cause and effect, and for those of us who um, have looked deeply into dependent origination, We can have a tendency, focusing on dependent origination, to think that causes come before effects, or that they're slightly different. But Master Ji Yi, in his insight, said to us, and Tai philosophy is one of the main threads that um, is present in, in Zen, he shared with us that cause and effect are one. Cause and effect are one. They're not separate. Our teacher calls this interdependent co-arising. Cause and effect, they are the same thing. The effect in terms of the spiritual life doesn't come after the cause. Also the cause. The cause is the effect. Our teacher shares with us in Plum Village this very deep insight in simple terms. He says, you are already what you want to become. Now this has two aspects. You are already what you want to become as the aspect that I spoke about before, that which we're looking for is already present for us. It's not something we need to strive for, look for somewhere else, uh, or rather something to uncover that's always been our original nature. But the other aspect of this teaching of you are already what you want to become is something that we call oneness of ourself and our environment. that through our life experiences, the choices that we've made, where we put our attention, we're not a victim of our circumstances at all, but rather we have carefully cultivated certain qualities that have brought us to this moment, and we are already what we have wanted to become. So this is quite a humbling realization. Oneness of person and environment. That our teacher Tay shares that the outer environment reflects what's taking place within us. That there's a relationship between those aspects, individual and collective manifestation. And so with this understanding of cause and effect being wonderfully together, we can have a sense of empowerment. And this is really what we're invited to do. In the place that Brother Bindin and I are staying is a, a little um, a writing on the wall that says, sit like a Buddha. And I was sitting there looking at this um, writing on the wall, sit like a Buddha. I said, you know, it's not perfect yet. Sit like a Buddha can mean that you're kind of still trying to be like a Buddha, but you're not the Buddha. You're like a Buddha. That's not the Buddha's teaching at all. In fact, um, in the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha basically says to everybody, everything I've told you up until now has been a lie. <laughs> it's all a lie. I was just telling you those things to get you in the get you out the door. But what I really want to say to you is from the very beginning you are all Buddhas. 
if you are hearing this teaching, you are a Buddha. That's what the Buddha says in the Lotus Sutra. And so, uh, what happened is that 5,000 people basically said, well, this is a whole heap of rubbish, and, and left. Um, a lot of the great disciples just walked out the door. Because the Buddha said, you, you are a Buddha already. Up until then, the Buddha was saying, you know, it's a little bit difficult to become a Buddha, so you better just cultivate something a little bit more basic. Um, don't try to become a Buddha. Another Buddha saying, you are actually a Buddha already. This is what I've wanted to say to you all along. So they walk out. This saying, sit like a Buddha. It's not really the, the, um, the actual teaching of a Buddha. The teaching of the Buddha is sit as a Buddha. Right here and right now. Walk as a Buddha. Eat as a Buddha. Drive your car, please, as, as a Buddha. <laughs> that would be very kind. <laughs> so how does this... This also is a fundamental misunderstanding. Sit like a Buddha, walk like a Buddha, because if we do that, we're still putting in a lot of effort to become something. And this tendency of becoming, the Buddha said, is the very basis of our suffering. Becoming something. Don't sit like a Buddha. Don't eat like a Buddha. Please don't waste your time. Just walk as a Buddha. Sit as a Buddha. Have Dharma discussion as a Buddha. Drive like a Buddha. Drive as a Buddha, sorry. <laughs> Not like a Buddha. You still put a lot of effort in. Drive as a Buddha. In each moment, I don't really want to give a class on Tiantai philosophy, although, well, actually I do, but um, it won't be today. Um, in Tiantai philosophy, there's a teaching of the 3,000 realms available in every moment. What this means is that in any moment, we might be experiencing something ordinary like the human realm, we might be experiencing some bliss, like the heavenly realm, we might be experiencing uh, a sense of uh, separation, a sense of loneliness, a sense of pain, some kind of difficult realm. But wherever we are, whatever we're experiencing, all the other realms, the realm of the Bodhisattva, the heavenly realm, the realm of the Buddha, the realm of peace, understanding, clarity, they're available, the choice is ours. We can touch all of those qualities, all of those different realms in each moment. So as a practitioner, our practice, if we understand the essence of the teaching, the Dharma is available here and now, and outside of space, outside of time, and in each moment, become one with what you're hoping to manifest. Manifest it here and now. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And in the Palm Village tradition, we emphasize the community as the manifestation of insight. Our teacher is not an individual. Um, our teacher is the Sangha. The real teacher of our life is the Sangha. So when we uh, share that we take refuge in the Sangha, or that the Sangha is a jewel, is not only an idea, but an every moment practice. We need to see um, the members of our Sangha as the greatest teachers. Sometimes we can have the tendency to think, yeah, I take refuge in the Sangha, except those couple of people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm annoying. 
And today, um, since we're uh, we're looking at sangha, I've been asked. The sisters have asked me to share a little bit about the order of interbeing. This retreat, in particular, is a very special celebration of the order of interbeing. It's an opportunity where we will be transmitting the mindfulness trainings of the order of interbeing. So I feel like I want to ask everyone a question, particularly the order of interbeing members. It might be interesting some point to, to also consider the responses of those who are not order of interbeing members. I want to ask you to consider to yourself deeply what's an order of interbeing member, member to you? Is it someone who has taken the 14 mindfulness trainings, someone who wears a brown jacket? What's the manifestation of an order of interbeing member to you? What's the role? of an order of interbeing member. I had uh, somebody say to me, I could never become an order of interbeing member because I don't know how to lead chanting and I don't want to sit at the bell, things like that. So is the manifestation of an order of interbeing member somebody who has to like, sit at the bell and do chanting and all these kind of things? Is that what you think an order of interbeing member is? Is it someone who wears a brown jacket? Anyone can wear a brown jacket easy to buy. At certain seasons, it's quite easy to buy. Um, we monastics have kind of noticed that since we, we basically wear three colors, brown, brown, and brown, it's quite easy when we wake up in the morning because we don't need to think, what's my wardrobe today? It's basically brown and brown. So, yeah, but it's quite interesting how many shades of brown there are, isn't it? So, and um, so we have to wait every few years because brown seems to come back in fashion. There are cycles. So it's about every four or five years that brown comes back in. So, and then you can easily buy a brown jacket. You could actually probably even buy one in the bookshop here, but so does that make you an OI member? Buy a brown jacket? Does the ceremony of transmission uh, make you an OI member? No. Sorry to disappoint those who are going to receive the transmission, but the transmission ceremony is a recognition of what should already be taking place in our mind and in our heart. It's not um, this moment in which before that you're not an OI member and after that you are. It's a process in which um, in you you have cultivated qualities and your local Sangha sees those qualities in you. The ceremony itself is a recognition and an affirmation of a process that's already taking place. So what's an OI member to you? I think I've, I, I've noticed that most mentorship programs in Australia, in the United States also, focus on the 14 mindfulness trainings. It's good, it's wonderful, it's important. Very few of the mentorship programs focus on reading and reflecting on the charter of the order of interbeing. That is a pity. That is a pity. I remember we had one OI retreat and people thought I was crazy, which I don't particularly mind, to be, to be honest, because I was insisting that as part of that um, mindfulness, uh, of, of part of our reflections of the, the 14 trainings, that we would actually spend time, rather than just reciting the 14 trainings, as we normally do in an OI retreat, that we would actually recite the charter. The 14 mindfulness trainings are a manifestation of the charter. The charter is not the manifestation of the 14 trainings, so the very essence of the order of interbeing is contained in the charter. I really recommend it. It's a beautiful thing. The purpose of the order of interbeing is to renew Buddhism. It's not an organization. If you read the charter, you see it's not an organization that we join. Being an order member also doesn't mean that we have a higher position. 
than others. We wear the color brown. A number of years ago, uh, uh, in some retreats, people say, who are these people in brown? They say, bossy. They're so self-important. So when I said people in brown, I think they were not only talking about OI members, they're probably talking about monastics. So bossy, so self-important. <laughs> the color brown uh, is the color of being like the earth. It is fruitful, as solid, as humble as the earth. Humble, the word humble comes from the word, etymologically, it comes from the word humus which means like the earth. It's also the color of uh, the very poor. It's the color that happens when we mix all different colors together. We get brown. <laughs> so there's a teaching here that we'll talk about a little later if we get to it. But there's a teaching of just becoming one, harmonizing with the situation of not standing out, of not making everything about ourselves, the holy trinity of I, me, and my. One of the qualities in the charter that we'll talk about a little later that Tay shared, because Tay wrote the charter, um, Tay shares an essential quality of an order into being member is generosity of spirit. Those three words, generosity of spirit. So it's not about I, me, and mine. In fact, in some way, hopefully, we disappear. And we're there supporting with the, the Bodhisattva spirit. So in the charter it, uh, itself, which I won't share in its entirety, but I invite you to read when you have time. The charter emphasizes th the four spirits which are also the four spirits of Plum Village, the four spirits in which, um, or upon which, we all of our practices and ways of approaching the practice have developed. The first, well maybe I'll just read that section from the Charter. The Charter says, literally, quote, the spirit of non-attachment from views and the spirit of direct experimentation lead to open-mindedness and compassion, both in the realm of perception of reality and in the realm of human relationships. So that could be enough for a whole retreat right there. That's enough like for like, actually many months. Here we're reminded um, that it's not only in terms of ideas. We're all very good at that. We're experts in ideas and views. So not only the realm of perception of reality is the spirit of non-attachment from views and direct experimentation important, but equally in the realm of human relationships. Buddhism, the practice doesn't mean anything if it's not applied, if it's not concrete. It's just a set of ideas, a set of notions, a set of techniques to the realm of human relationships and the spirit of appropriateness and the spirit of skillful means lead to a capacity to be creative and to reconcile. Creative here reminds me of the time that Tay shared with me, and he shared many different things with many different Dharma teachers, but with me, he shared, if you're doing the same thing in 20 years, you have failed. Now, so this didn't mean just throw the baby out with the bath. Not just to focus on external practices, but rather to look at the way that I approach those practices. To look at the ways that I approach certain understandings. And not to just be repeating things in a kind of rote way. And I think this is an important invitation for each of us as practitioners. How can we approach this breath, this step, this um, uh, encounter in a new way? Something fresh, something different, something to discover. As we know in the 14 trainings, it says, I'm ready to learn and I will learn throughout my life. The knowledge I presently possess is not changeless, absolute truth. And if our truth is found in life, then 
we need to be continually growing, continually developing, and also the order into being and Plum Village practice needs to be continually growing, continually developing. At this moment in time when our great teacher has just passed away, there's such a tendency to lock everything down and to say, okay, this is Plum Village practice and it will never change. This is the be-all and end-all of Plum Village practice. I always smile like when people ask me, you know, or tell me, like, this is Plum Village practice. Because I've seen so many, I've been in the community so long, and I, I, I've just seen so many different manifestations of, uh, of Plum Village practice. We've had so many different um, uh, practices that have been proposed by Tay, and some are still with us, some are no longer with us. We used to do every single morning before sitting meditation, we used to have fast walking meditation, kind of like a running meditation. These kind of things, since we don't really do them anymore, they've just kind of moved on. <coughs> We've had so many different forms, and so I, I see people struggle with things like, is it okay to have sitting, then walking, then sitting? Or do we need to have walking and sitting? And some guys have kind of had disharmony because of the <laughs> Uh, these things. So our teacher Tay was always a visionary, always uh, very deeply connected with roots, and then when we're deeply connected with our roots, we're not afraid to to innovate. So. Le these qualities lead to a capacity to be creative and to reconcile, both of which are necessary for the service of living beings. The order of interbeing rejects dogmatism in both looking and acting, and it seeks all forms of action that can revive and sustain the true spirit of insight and compassion in life. So notice here that it seeks all forms of action. It doesn't seek all forms of ideas, perceptions, notions, and academic papers, as good as they are. It seeks all forms of action. This is probably important to mention, it doesn't seek all forms of reaction. It's enough reaction <laughs> in our world and in the world of our mind already, but rather it seeks all forms of action. It considers this spirit to be more important than any Buddhist institution or tradition. That's a lion's roar right there, particularly when we're thinking about the Plumbilis tradition or we're thinking about the order into being. It considers this spirit of uh, experimentation, non-attachment from views, appropriateness, and skillful means as more important than any Buddhist institution or tradition. The reason for that is a Buddhist tradition, Buddhist lineage, Buddhist practice is simply a container in order, one form, in order to be able to express those qualities. With the aspiration of a bodhisattva, I really, please everybody, write this down, inscribe it on your heart, please, if we're a good student of our teacher. With the aspiration of a bodhisattva, a being that's of service to themselves and the world around, members of the orders of, order of interbeing seek to change what? Themselves. In order to change society. When we think of social action, lately we think a lot, especially those of us who are in the activist realm, which is a wonderful and powerful realm to be in, we often think of the outward forms of action first of all. The challenge is that if we're not careful, we become what we're fighting against. This is, it's very easy to become a reactivist The order of into being invites us 
to see that the outer environment reflects the inner environment and we change ourselves in order to change society. We want less anger, less violence, less discrimination, at the same time as engaging with, because again, outside of space, outside of time, cause and effect are one, at the same time as engaging in actions for social change. We recognize and transform those seeds within our own mind, our own heart, seeing that they're connected. Seeking to change themselves in order to change society in the direction of compassion and understanding. How? By living a joyful and meaningful life. Again, this sense of bliss body. There's no, in the order of interbeing, we don't want to have these two serious practitioners. I remember in China, uh, uh, when I was there, they used to call long-term practitioners dried up pawpaws, dried up papayas. <laughs> no more juice. No more juice. We, as practitioners, we need to have that enjoyment body. If you have that enjoyment body, you have that uh, uh, solidity, then it's, you create this energy around yourself that people just want to be a part of. Are you taking a photo of <laughs> This is only the retribution body. <laughs> uh, this sense of enjoyment, this sense of delight, this sense a little bit of uh, uh, playfulness with the way that we encounter with things, it's impossible for people not to enjoy that. This is uh, the quality that uh, we really hope um, to be able to offer to ourselves and to the world around. And I think it's one of the most important qualities in terms of practice and also in terms of being able to cultivate lasting change. When we think about, or we reflect on the, the four spirits of Plum Village and the first one, and, and the order of interbeing, and the first one being non-attachment from views. Uh, the other day, one of our friends was sharing with me that she's been listening to the, the Brother from Lou's wonderful classes on the 40 tenets of Plum Village. And in the 40 tenets, or the 40 principles of Plum Village, the Plum Village lineage, it, uh, there's an invitation from Pei. Um, it says, each generation of Buddhist practitioners has to resist the human tendency and need to try to find a principle, an idea, a notion, uh, an, an ideology, or a tradition, to find the place of a self. So we try to create a self around our identities. It's kind of a human uh, tendency. In some of the most ancient teachings of the Buddha, in the Book of Eights, the Atagavaga, which you can find in the Pali Canon, the Sutta Nipata, the Buddha said that um, our practice, um, our, the fruit of our practice also, is the practice of releasing things, of letting things go, not of getting, getting things. Isn't that interesting to reflect on? come to practice because we want to get something, to get happy, to get enlightened, to get peace, but the practice right in the Pali Canon is about letting things go. Especially, the Buddha said, our views and our positions, not to take on more of them. Our teacher Pei puts this in a very succinct way in the uh, beginning of the heart of the Buddha's teaching. Buddhism is about letting go of all views, not taking on new ones. So this is a, a really nice and important reflection to engage in from time to time. 
to reflect on what is our practice of Buddhism? What, how does it manifest in our life? Is it a set of behaviors? Is it a set of dogmas, of ideologies that we try to fit ourselves into? Or does it manifest in a different way? One of the ways I really feel that our teacher Tay was hoping that we would manifest our Buddhism is that uh, just as we shared earlier, we walk in such a way, we eat in such a way, we breathe in such a way that mindfulness is not something that we're doing, not something that we perform, a ritual that we do or something like that, but rather it's just who we are. It's our natural behavior. It's kind of like um, when we're making a, a cup of tea, we're making a pot of tea, you put the tea leaves um, and the water together. If the water's at the right temperature for those kind of tea leaves, then at some mystical, magical moment, that water is not called water anymore. It's called tea. If somebody gave you a cup of water and said, here's a cup of tea, you kind of think, hmm, that would be the skin. But then if uh, somebody gives you a cup of tea, uh, water in which tea leaves have been steeped, and then says, here's a cup of water, you also think, hmm, this is a bit... Strange. The water has become tea. It's not putting any effort in at all. If the conditions are right, those tea leaves without any effort at all, and the water uh, without any effort at all, they become, in a sense, one. So in the same way that those tea leaves infuse the water with their fragrance, it was and is, I feel, our teacher's hope that that energy of mindfulness also infuses everything that we do. So it's not something that we perform, but rather it's just who we are. It's our way of moving through the world. It's our Dharma in its original sense, which is our way of showing up. The second of the four spirits is this direct experimentation. And it actually says in the charter that direct experimentation it's direct experimentation on the nature of interdependent origination. So looking deeply into cause and effect. Cause and effect outside of space, outside of time. The co-arising of cause and effect. This effect is the cause of the quote-unquote next one. And so on. But not only through our intellect, but the, the uh, charter says, through meditation. So not reading things about cause and effect and reciting what other people have said about it, but looking deeply through cultivating this energy of presence, looking deeply at cause and effect in our own life and the lives of those around, recognizing this pattern as it is. The third quality is appropriateness. The third of the spirits of the order into being is appropriateness. Master Yun Men, Master Cloud Gate, who is one of the great Zen teachers, in fact, there's a school of Zen in um, south of China called the Cloud Gate School. He was once asked, what is Buddhist practice? What's the heart of Buddhist practice? And he said, an appropriate response. An appropriate response. Each day, each moment is different. If you're a musician, um, then you know that uh, every single time you play a piece, um, you have a choice. You can play it technically perfectly, exactly as the... Um, the composer has written. And if you do that, if you play technically perfectly, exactly as the composer has written, you have a great career. It might last you know, five, ten years or something. But then it will kind of be done because you come in and it's just playing it exactly the same over and over again. Again, there's no, none of that uh, juice, none of the juice of the papaya, the pawpaw. 
but a musician is kind of at the next level who come in into the hall and they have first of all a relationship with their own inner state this is how I'm feeling in this moment this is you know what happened for me today what's happening in my consciousness right here and right now secondly there's a relationship with the hall the space that they're in this is the size of the hall these are the people that are seated right there. We co-create this together. This is the kind of energy that's in the room. This is what I want to offer. This is what I feel is going to be helpful. A little bit like a cook kind of tasting and saying, ah, it needs a little bit of uh, salt, needs a little bit of maybe a bay leaf, needs something like that. So this is energy of a, of a musician. This is the energy that I need to bring. And then we have a relationship with our instrument. It's the kind of sound that this instrument can make. And so, if we have that understanding, we adjust our for all of those situations. We don't play the same way if we had a, a piano, we wouldn't play the same way in here as we would in the Sydney Opera House, for example. It wouldn't be appropriate. It would blow everybody's ears off. Um, it really wouldn't be something that everyone would enjoy. And in the same way, if we go to the Sydney Opera House and we play the same way that we play in this hall, it would be like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So this is what we need to do in terms of our mindfulness practice, in terms of our practice. We adjust our playing to the hall. We adjust our practice to the situation, each and every moment. This is what is meant by being appropriate. It can also mean that uh, this teaching that we have in Zen, that there's the fragrance of practice and then the stink of Zen. You know, um, if we really understand the spirit of appropriateness, this is the heart of the spirit of the Bodhisattva, which um, in the order of into being is one of our guiding spirits. What it means is to accord with the situation, to harmonize with the situation. If everyone is in a situation where um, they're, they're doing something, the spirit of the Bodhisattva is to be there, but all to be there and to harmonize, to meet people where, the, where they're at, and also at the same time, to offer something in that space, to not somehow be separate from it. In the Lotus Sutra, we meet a, a very wonderful bodhisattva called Wondrous Sound. We had a sister who, um, not here in, in uh, Nyoklu, but uh, she used to be in Blue Cliff, called Wondrous Sound. And whenever I would meet her, she's originally from Jamaica, and whenever I would meet her, I would think about this Bodhisattva in the Lotus Sutra. This Bodhisattva used to, it said in the Lotus Sutra, takes on 34 different forms to teach the Dharma. 34 different forms. It's able to meet people where they're at, to meet situations where they're at, and offer something of value in those situations. And it might be different for each situation, each person, but there's not the stink of practice. We're not sharing um, some kind of, necessarily some kind of technique or some kind of thing, but rather we're actually demonstrating and offering those qualities. So as an order into being member, there can be a tendency to kind of uh, get caught up in a particular form. But what we want to do, and what's of most value, is to be able to offer those qualities. And then the fourth is what we call skillful means. Skillful means is a translation of a Sanskrit word, upaya. And it's shared, like uh, it, uh, shared with us, that this quality of skillful means, it goes along with appropriateness. And a teaching, something that can be of benefit to others, needs to meet the needs of people, the actual needs, and also reflect the realities of daily life. This is why 
in the order of interbeing, it's not the idea that the monastics are somehow like deeper practitioners or higher or whatever. There's not this sense of subservience. But rather, we respect and we work together as a manifold community because each of us has our experience. For example, those of us who are living householder lives, I, I don't really like the term layperson because in English, layperson can mean somebody who's not an expert on something. Like, I'm a layperson when it comes to construction. That's just how it is. Brother Ben, he's, uh, he, he's very uh, uh, good with all this construction and things like that. But I'm a layperson with construction. So I don't really enjoy that term layperson. It's also not a term that's actually used in the original text. This is something that was proposed by an Anglican pastor <laughs> as a translation in uh, the late 1800s, layperson. In fact, the term is householder in um, the original text. And I think that's much more helpful. Those of us who are at home, and then those of us who are left home. So, the monastics. And each of those uh, realms, we have our specialties, for example. We have the, the realms in which we have a lot of experience. And one is not better than another. And we need all of those uh, areas of experience. The monastics uh, need the experience of those who are householders so that the teachings that we offer are appropriate. And in the same way, it's helpful. I think you probably, well, you might agree. I, I don't know, I'm just, maybe I shouldn't assume. <laughs> you might agree that uh, the left home perspective, like those of us here in the monastic form have left our homes, also provides a perspective, a balance for your experience as householders. We have different um, experiences, we have different focuses, and we need each other. So it needs to reflect the realities of daily life, and it also needs to meet two criteria or something to be considered skillful action or upaya. And that is, it needs to be in line with the basic um, insights of Buddhism. In Plum Village, Ateya said, and he said this, if ever you listen to a Dharma talk of a Plum Village monastic, and it doesn't have the Dharma seal of, I have arrived, I am home, in there, and that you are already what you want to become, it's not a Plum Village teaching. If the Dharma teacher comes up and says, you have to work hard, really hard, and then you'll get it in 50 years, then it's not um, an authentic teaching of Plum Village. Simple. In the same way, uh, for something to be skillful, it needs to be in line with the basic teachings of Buddhism. Even if it doesn't have the smell of Buddhism, but it needs to, to be in line with the basic teachings of Buddhism. And then it also, that's not enough. It's not enough for somebody to just be um, offering that, but it also needs to be truly relevant to the person and helpful. Truly relevant and helpful. And it's said in the text that this quality of skillful means is... The, tech, the actual phrase in the, in the Chinese is it's a bit technical. It says, Upaya is the activity of prajna which manifests as compassion. So, prajna is insight. Now, insight by itself, it's not going to necessarily uh, help anybody. But in Mahayana Buddhism, in the Great Vehicle Buddhism, Insight has to go together with compassion. And that's what we usually teach about. Insight and compassion go together. Everybody nods their head and says, it's really nice. Especially when somebody gives the image of wisdom is one wing of the bird, compassion is the other wing of the bird. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so lovely. We spend a lot of time thinking about wisdom and compassion floating through the sky. Upaya, it said, is the concrete manifestation. Skillful means is the concrete manifestation that occurs when wisdom and compassion have come together in our experience. 
that they will always manifest as action. Rather than just ideas. These two qualities, when they come together, they have to express themselves in the world. And when we say the world here, we're not only talking about the world outside, but also the world within our own consciousness. The Buddha said the world first and foremost is within these two meters. So it manifests here and it manifests around. Upaya is the concrete manifestation of insight and compassion. In our tradition, we talk about the three doors of liberation. Three doors of liberation, not two liberation. Emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. In Pure Land Buddhism, which gets a bad rap um, in the West, in the modern world, in Pure Land Buddhism, Dindo, the three doors of liberation are described as upaya, the sense of being skillful, skillful means. This is a, a door of liberation. And then the other door is insight. And the third door is compassion in Pure Land Buddhism. And I think sometimes it's helpful to, to consider those three doors consider those three doors of liberation because they're very practical. And I see them in the, the 14 trainings. This element of skillfulness, of adjusting our plane to suit the room, of wisdom, of looking deeply, of seeing all the causes and conditions that have come together in this situation. Things are not as simple as they look. Everything's part of a whole system. So seeing that whole totality. And if we see that, how does that manifest? If we see that whole, all those causes and conditions, then we have this ache, this longing of our heart that we call compassion. If we speak of compassion, and skillfulness as being the defining qualities of the order of interbeing. We also see that they're kind of the defining qualities of these beings that we call bodhisattvas, that we're asked to be, not to become, but to be, as members um, of the order of interbeing. And a bodhisattva is said to have four skillful actions. If we speak about upayas, skillful means. A bodhisattva is said to have four kinds of skillful means. The first is making the three kinds of offerings. That's the first skillful means. Never missing the chance to make an offering. This is not a tricky way to try to get donations, by the way. <laughs> We're not handing out envelopes at the end of this talk. Everyone can just breathe out. That's okay. <laughs> The first is material, material gifts, which everybody's clear about. This is only one aspect of, of giving. The second is the gift of the Dharma. And the third is the gift of non-fear. There are the three kinds of, of offerings. So never missing that chance to show up, to offer non-fear, to offer Dharma in a sense of qualities. And if it's necessary, material gifts. The second kind of skillful action of a bodhisattva, which is one I think we can um, can all relate to and joyfully cultivate, is loving speech. That's the second of the four skillful actions of a bodhisattva: loving speech. And the third is always acting to benefit oneself and others. So if I say, like, always uh, uh, acting to benefit oneself, we think that's selfish. But in the insight of Buddhism, benefiting self and others go together. So we can't uh, uh, just benefit others to our own detriment, or vice versa. But always acting to benefit self and others. 
and this might not necessarily be um, gentle. This can also be strong. Compassion has at least two faces. One is very gentle, and one can be very fierce. Sometimes we need the, the sword to cut through. But always acting to, benefit, of, to be of benefit. When we reflect on this too, it's also quite humbling, because honestly, in each and every moment, we can only do our best. And if we really understand that the knowledge we currently have, the insight that we currently have, might only be partial. Then, if we reflect on always acting to benefit self and others, and we, like in a few weeks, few months, we kind of look back, we know that perhaps, uh, well, even though we did the best in that moment that we thought we could do, there might be something slightly different that we would do at this point, knowing what we know now. So it's quite humbling. And then the fourth of the qualities is one that's very subtle and um, really challenging to cultivate. And the fourth of the skillful actions of a bodhisattva is called doing the same thing. It doesn't mean doing the same thing year after year after year after year, but what it means is actually in whichever situation we're in, harmonizing ourselves with that situation meeting people where they're at, meeting a situation where they're at. This is also a way of offering non-fear. The Charter tells us that non-attachment from views and direct experimentation with the truth are the two most important qualities of the order and interview. They go together. of the order into being, there's a quality that we're invited to cultivate in each other and in ourselves, and that quality is called generosity of spirit. Uh, sisters asked me in particular to speak about the path of service in um, the, the OI, the order into being. When I was reflecting on this, I realized that the very core, the very essence of this, is this spirit of generosity this open-heartedness of always being willing to say yes. This doesn't mean um, that we have no boundaries or things, but what it means is that we don't close ourselves off from a situation or from a but rather we consider how best to respond. When we think about generosity of spirit, I also reflect on, in our actual trainings, the 14 trainings, it said, I will not use the Buddhist community for personal gain or profit. It's just an interesting phrase. I was just thinking, how would I uh, get a lot of profit from using Yop Lu's name or Plum Village name or things like that? It's not so easy. So we can read this sentence and we kind of think, oh yeah, like, I wouldn't want to like, sell a whole lot of, like, make a lot of posters about myself and <laughs> all these kind of things. We can kind of understand it in that way. There's another way to understand it as well. And like the outer meaning, of course, is power, prestige, persuasion, trying to become a, a really big deal. What do they call it? A big fish in a small pond kind of situation, making it all about ourselves. And this is really the wisdom of Tay. Because Tay saw that we have this cult of charisma in uh, Western society, but also it's manifesting in Buddhism as well. Uh, the, the cult of the uh, very powerful, but very big, very famous teacher. And Tay has always said that in the Plum Village tradition, a real teacher will point to the brilliance of the Sangha, They're not point to themselves point to the brilliance of the Sangha. So if yeah. we think we have to go here, we have to go there to see this teacher or that teacher, in Plum Village tradition, it's not the way. 
we, we go to um, connect with the Sangha. And a teacher, a, a, a Dharma teacher in the Thombilis tradition will always remind people that the greatest teacher is the Sangha, the community, not themselves. So the outer meaning of this phrase, I will not use the Buddhist community for personal gain or profit, is of course this power, this prestige, this persuasion. But also there's another layer of meaning. That is that, and it's actually, it's very subtle. I will not use this community for my own spiritual advancement at the expense of others. The Bodhisattva path at its core is a path in which we've seen those qualities that we want to manifest in our life and in the world. But the Bodhisattva vow is that I'm not going to cultivate those things without others. That this journey is a journey that I will make it together with everybody else. Even if I could go fast. <laughs> I'm not going to go fast. I will go together. No matter what. I'll go together. Even with those two annoying people in my sangha who I wish were not there. <laughs> I will not use the community. I will not use the knowledge that I gain of Buddhist teachings, Buddhist practices, all these kind of things. For my own spiritual advancement at the expense of others. I will not use the community for personal gain or profit. So when we hear that training, I hope that that unpacks another layer for us to consider in this training, and particularly with its relationship to the path of service. We go together. In the beginning of our practice, as we shared before, we want peace, we want happiness, and so on. And this is an understandable starting point. But it's also the small vehicle. It's the vehicle of I, me, and mine. I want this, I want that. This is a small vehicle of getting something. I want to get enlightenment, to get liberation, to get peace, and so on. Hopefully, as order of interbeing members, we want to move beyond this in order to practice being of service. This is the great vehicle, the Mahayana path. It means to see at its heart every experience of our life, every person we come into contact with, every feeling, every perception that we have as our spiritual path. Not, sitting, not just sitting in the meditation hall, not just listening to Dharma talks, but every single boring moment as our spiritual path. And the beginnings of this great path, the big vehicle, is to cultivate a quality that is called bodhicitta. I like to, to uh, uh, share that bodhicitta the essence of the practice of bodhicitta, this quality of a bodhisattva, this quality of the mind of love, in a concrete way, can be cultivated by looking at it as bodhicitta, being a good friend, of not seeing anyone as an enemy, of not seeing any part of ourself, any feeling, any perception, any part of ourself, as an enemy, but to become a good friend. If you become a good friend to somebody, if you become a good friend to yourself, then you're present for, you're present with, looking deeply, holding space for that person or that situation. If that's not the essence of bodhicitta, then I don't really know what is. Becoming a good buddy, a good friend to yourself, and to the world around. I think for many of us, particularly those of us raised in the West, 
we can become more easily a good friend for those around. But also, we need to spend time becoming a good friend to ourselves and to our own experience. In the uh, next few days, we'll be having a transmission ceremony of the 14 trainings of the Order into Being. And so for me, I really wanted to share <clears throat> Reflecting on the transmission of the 14 trainings, I also felt it would be helpful to share a little bit about the function of ethics in our community, ethics or mindfulness trainings. Many of us in the West, we've also grown up with the idea of mindfulness trainings kind of like commandments or rules, whether they're the five mindfulness trainings or the 14. The function of ethics in Buddhism is quite different. They're actually not rules or commandments. In Buddhist psychology, you'll very quickly find out that I didn't go to art school. Does <laughs> anybody want to hazard a guess <laughs> to what this is? Oh, wow, I, I feel like I've, you've all just watered my flower. <laughs> so I remember spending a lot of time in art class at school and I, I drew um, a cow <laughs> for, the, for the art class. And I was so proud of this cow and even the teacher came over and said, everyone was supposed to draw a cow, why did you draw a dog? <laughs> <laughs> we all have an art room. <laughs> so in Buddhist psychology, um, we understand that the Buddhas, and the Buddha actually shared this himself, that Buddhist practice is aimed at transforming three roots in our consciousness. That most of our unskilled, if not all of our unskillful thoughts, words and actions, behaviors, come out of one or some combination of these three roots. The first is greed. I always want more. Or it can manifest as, I don't have this quality, therefore I need to get it somewhere. I've got to get something more, and then finally I will arrive. The other one is ill will, or hatred. Ill will. This is basically closing down our heart, shutting things out, pushing something away. So it can manifest as a kind of hatred, this big hatred or rage or anything like that, but also this closing down of the heart towards ourselves, towards others, to, to try to cut off a part of our experience, to say this is bad, that's bad, this is not good, this kind of sense here. And then uh, delusion. I tend to translate uh, as delusion rather than ignorance. Because uh, delusion has more of a sense of not seeing things clearly, of just being confused. I think it's a, a much more helpful translation. So these three roots exist in our consciousness. And most of our unhelpful, notice I'm not saying negative, I'm saying unhelpful. Because in Buddhism, there's the teaching that the poison itself is the medicine. So our practice is to turn the poison into medicine. So we're not trying to get rid of greed. We're not trying to get rid of hatred. If you just try to get rid of hatred, you're using hatred to get rid of hatred. Right? So what we're trying to do is to, to understand the causes and conditions. How these things manifest in, each, in, in us. They manifest in slightly different ways in each one of us. The things that uh, you're drawn to might be different from the things that I'm drawn to in each moment. For example, uh, 
Some of us might be smelling the lunch that's cooking and think, ah, it's such a good smell. It's such a good smell. Others are like, ooh, I'm just going to eat rice today. <laughs> or uh, hatred or ill will, these kind of feelings. They manifest slightly differently. If you're a student of the, the text, um, the Buddha taught in one of two formulations, two threefold formulations. The, the motto of Plum Village is Sila Samadhi Prajna. This is one of the formulations. In fact, it's considered to be the higher training for people who are already serious about meditation. If you study the text, you know that the sutras either form, fall under one of these two formulations. For beginning practitioners, the Buddha taught the formulation like this. Nana which is giving, generosity, and so on. Sila. Ethics. Ethical behavior. And then uh, Bhavana. Which means, uh, sometimes it's translated as meditation, but it actually means mental cultivation. And I love that, because uh, meditation can have a sense in English of being kind of passive. But actually, um, the Buddha taught cultivating our mind, cultivating our heart, cultivating certain qualities in our mind. So this is the introductory level. And there are a number of sutras. When you read a text from the Pali Canon, um, there are a number of sutras that, as you read them, you see it falls under this category. Some of us have the idea that if we went to receive a teaching from the Buddha, the Buddha would just immediately teach us all about like, the highest forms of meditation and insight and so on. Not the case, friends, not the case. Um, if you went to, uh, to receive a teaching from the Buddha, very often the Buddha would teach, first of all, about generosity. Teach people about generosity. Why? Maybe I shouldn't go too far down this path because it's not what I'm supposed to be talking about. But, uh, <laughs> why? Well, yes, but also there are no pairs of opposites oh. <laughs> in, the, in uh, Buddhism. But rather because in the very beginning, uh, with our spiritual practice, if we, we're encouraged to cultivate generosity in those forms that we shared about before, what are we actually doing? We're creating a relationship with those around. Our spiritual practice is not something that's up on the mountain or something, but the way that we interact with each other the way that we are in the world. So, the very beginning, rather than teaching that spiritual uh, practice is kind of removed from daily life, the Buddha was teaching people um, to, to connect with others, that our spiritual insight is manifested through how we connect with others. Ethics and mental cultivation. So each of these, although they interrelate, and these three roots are also deeply connected, some of which may be deeper in some people than others, each of these practices, giving, ethics, and mental development, relate specifically to transforming one of these roots. For example, giving. What do you think it would help to translate most of, uh, to transform most of all? Greed. Okay. So, nana. Giving. What about bhavana, to, uh, cultivating our mind? What root would it work mostly on? Delusion. Delusion. Wow, this is an advanced class. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to graduate this class. Just do it. Then, ethics. Any guesses? <laughs> Pretty easy. Okay. <coughs> Your will. <coughs> Hatred. Isn't that interesting? Because sometimes we approach ethics with our Western or modern mindset as a way to judge ourselves, as a way to kind of put down everyone around us. It becomes something heavy, something hard, something that we punish with. The function of ethics in Buddhism, is a practice of loving kindness, cultivating loving kindness towards ourselves and to those around. 
It consists of two aspects, performing actions of benefit for self and others, and refraining from actions that harm ourselves and harm others. The function of mindfulness trainings is to cultivate loving kindness. For the, so for those of us who are taking the 14 trainings, or for those of us who are practicing the five mindfulness trainings, it's so important all the time to ask ourselves, how is this practice, this mindfulness training, helping me to open my heart every day just a little bit more, to be kinder, to be more open, to be more friendly towards myself and others each and every day. So this is the first level of the threefold training for beginners. There is no such thing. And then the second level is the Plum Village motto. Sila. In the Pali it's Sila, in Sanskrit it's Smriti. So I'll put the in, in the Sanskrit because that's what's written on the Plum Village window. Smriti. Samadhi. Okay, so let's start with something easy. Which one, uh, on the higher level of training, which uh, of the roots do you think uh, Smriti or Sila helps to transform? Is it different on the higher level or is it the same? Should be the same. Congratulations, you just graduated this class. Okay. Yeah, the same. What about samadhi? Sometimes translated as concentration, but me being as I am, as I studied the Pali language, I found that the word concentration in English doesn't really, uh, is not really helpful as a translation for samadhi. Um, concentration in English is kind of mental concentration. Um, and we know if we're mentally concentrated and things, we feel exhausted afterwards. Samadhi is a, a sense of immersion with, oneness with, the object of our attention. Um, and it brings about a sense of refreshment. So we're one with our breathing, we're one with our step, we're immersed in it, we're not separate from it. So what's, uh, what does this sense of immersion help to cultivate? Okay. Good, good uh, guess. <laughs> but actually, the, the practice of samadhi here, it's a little bit of a trick question. It actually helps us to cultivate, uh, to transform uh, the root of greed. Because as we cultivate the sense of being immersed in um, uh, the object of our attention, our breath, our step, then we stop all of our running around. Sometimes people, uh, they say things like, oh, Thich Nhat Hanh just speaks baby talk and, and things like that. But actually, if we begin to see, uh, uh, begin, begin to understand Tay's teaching, we see that Tay actually is like a mother. Tay took this very rich and deep food from uh, the depths of Buddhist psychology or Tian Tai philosophy or other things, chewed it up and spat it out in a way that we can understand where he used to tell us, stop all of your running around. When we practice, um, when we cultivate this sense of being one with, then we, we also we begin to see we have more than enough already right now. We don't need, um, our mind doesn't run here, run there, uh, after this, after that. But we're just settled into our experience. And then in that case, prajna, insight. Let's put it in English. On the higher level, of the training uh, works with uh, cultivating our, uh, 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 transforming our tendency towards not seeing clearly. We penetrate to the heart of things. So, for teachings, uh, sutras that have been given for beginners, for people who are new to the practice, there's this formulation. But sutras that are for meditators, for practitioners, for people who are established on the path follow this formulation. An example of that was actually the discourse that we heard and read this morning, which is the discourse on love. Those of you who have done my course will, will know immediately that this is the formulation of the discourse on love. You can actually break down the verses in the discourse on love to, to, uh, to this formulation. The reason I share this 
It's partially because this is the model of Pong Village. Partially to help everybody to understand this, but mainly for us who are taking the trainings. As an invitation for us, as we take on these trainings, or as we continue our practice of the five mindfulness trainings, to always consider how is this practice helping me to cultivate loving kindness? How is it helping me open my heart? How is it helping me to reconnect both the parts of myself and with those around? Otherwise, it's not really the mindfulness trainings if they're not helping you in your daily life to notice when your heart closes down, when your mind closes down, when you turn away, then it's not performing its function. So this is the essential function of ethics, of mindfulness trainings in the Buddhist tradition. And so for me, I want, really wanted to just end my talk today with that invitation from my heart um, as we consider and look into the realm of ethics, to see it as an act of love for yourself, an act of self-care and an act of other care. So dear friends, um, I hope that something has been helpful in this talk. If it hasn't been helpful, then I hope that you've enjoyed um, the time sitting in this hall. If you haven't enjoyed the time sitting in this hall, <laughs> then the good news is it's about to come to its completion. <laughs> I wish you very happy next moments. So let's find ourselves in a comfortable position. We can come back to our breathing, come back to our bodies, and we'll enjoy three sounds of the bell. without sharing anything. Um, that's because in those moments, there's no stories, there's no jokes, there's nothing about the weather, there's no one that we're talking about, but I'm just me, you're just you, and we're having this moment of connection. So our eyes might meet each other, and if they do, during the time of noble silence, just take a moment to enjoy that connection. And you don't know that person's story. Perhaps, honestly, after this retreat, we might not see each other again. That's the reality. Um, but here you are both in the same place, having this moment of connection. Just you and, and that person. Beautiful. So just enjoy that. Um, being in silence, and we'll serve our food in silence. And uh, we'll make our way to one of the tables. What can be very beautiful is if we um, try to uh, like fill up tables one by one. So if we see that there's one person sitting over here, come and sit with them. We'll fill up that table first and uh, fill up all the tables. And we'll just um, have a chance to um, sit there following our breathing, um, being present with our friends. And we'll wait until there's the sounds of the bell. We'll have the sounds of the bell and the five contemplations. And then we'll begin the eating together in silence for about 15 or 20 minutes. So as you come and you sit down, it's a great opportunity to see how applied your mindfulness is, knowing that we practice um, applied mindfulness here. So just double check and see, do you actually have a spoon to eat with? Do you have the, you know, the things that you're going to need? Um, because after we begin eating, we try to minimize our moving around the hall. We treat it just like a meditation hall. Um, so in, in sitting meditation time, in the morning and the evening, we kind of don't walk around everywhere, but we just remain seated. So in the same way, we treat our food really um, with that same attention. Uh, and then, uh, you know, 
maybe you're sitting there and you start eating you think, oh, if I, only I could have a little spray of soy sauce. Perfect. These little tragedies happen. You'll be okay. <laughs> so, and as 